Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, almost good evening. This way of um, the sun setting too soon in the day is a little bit confusing, but good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, my name is Bruna Santos. I'll be your moderator for this afternoon, for this next session. If any of you who's sitting at the chairs want to join the table, please feel free to do so. Um, it might be slightly more comfortable. Um, and this is a session on, that's called Unpacking Digital Trade Impacts, Calling All Stakeholders. Um, I, am, uh, I work for a Brazilian organization called Coding Rights. Um, we have been working on this intersection of privacy, digital rights, most specifically privacy, but digital rights and gender. And um, this panel was co-organized with two colleagues, um, Peter Sihon for the, from the Center for the Governance of AI, and also Thomas Stewart from the American University. Um, the idea for today will be to discuss some implications on the emerging international trade policies for the internet and how they have been um, either discussed or being used around the world. So we will go a little bit through the, the politics and the policy part of it and then do some discussions on the multi-stakeholder model and why is it so important for us to keep on, refer keep on referring back to this sort of participation when mm -hmm. we are discussing um, trade and policies related to the internet. Um, and for this session, we, ha we will have um, four speakers. Um, we will have Miguel Canje Barra, if I'm pronouncing the name correctly, who is from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Paraguay. Also Kathleen Berger from Mozilla. Guilherme Beltra from Access Now, and Thomas Truitt, who is um, based on the George Washington University and also will join us remotely. And um, this session will be divided in three sections. Part one will be unpacking discussions and development of digital trade norms and policies. So this will be the part um, in which we'll, we'll talk a little bit about relation to national governments, taxation, um, larger globalization, and international trade, in, trade institutions. Um, and for this first part, we will have a little exchange in between Thomas and Miguel. So I'll give the floor to Thomas right now. And um, yes, Thomas, I hope you're hearing us, and I hope the remote participation works. I can hear you. Uh, can you hear me all right? OK, perfect. Uh, so. Hi, I'm uh, Thomas Stewart. I'm currently uh, based out of the, or I work at the Digital Trade and Data Governance Hub based out of George Washington University in Washington, DC. And basically the hub just started in June and its goal is to educate policymakers about digital trade and data governance issues through events and trainings. But basically this, the whole idea of this hub grew out of this previous work. Uh, okay. Um, so this, this hub grew out of previous work, which basically examined national laws and trade agreements and conducted a global survey with stakeholders uh, in digital trade to get a sense of digital trade norms. And what we basically found was that there really are like a lack of norms and shared definitions around digital trade issues. And this is even, this is echoed in the more recent uh, report from Internet and Jurisdiction Global Statuses report from 2019. Uh, the report found 95% of stakeholders say that cross-border legal challenges will increase uh, in the next year. And 80% believe there is still not enough coherence to address these challenges. So basically, with that, here we are today talking about how why multi-stakeholder approach uh, is needed in digital trade. And basically, I see I see this mainly because trade agreements have been covering these digital issues for a while now, but this process of creating these agreements have a lack of transparency and they really don't have, and they're not multi-stakeholder in nature. Uh, so trade agreements are covering digital issues more and more. Uh, we see this in comparison to the new USMCA, the United States, Mexico, Canada agreement, uh, compared to the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, basically, both of them have language on data localization, but it's pretty it's pretty telling to see uh, the the language uh, in the USMCA is is newer and it's a lot more comfortable in governing these uh, digital trade issues. Under the TPP, it says uh, Article 14 
says each party shall allow the cross-border transfer of information by electronic means, including personal information, when this activity is for the conduct of the business of a recovered person. While the newer USMCA, it goes even further and it makes this provision, uh, like it uses a negative statement and it says no party shall prohibit or restrict the cross-border transfer of information, including personal information transfer of information, including personal information by electronic means, if this activity is for the conduct of the business of a covered person. And also the TPP allows for exceptions when it says each party shall, each party may have its own regulatory requirements regarding the use of computing facilities, including requirements that seek to ensure the security and confidentiality of, communi of communication. So basically, uh, we're seeing these these trade agreements. Basically, they're getting more and more comfortable with governing the cross border data flow of information. Uh, so the USMCA allows for basically less room for exceptions with its simpler use of language and the use of the negative. And and it's important to to notice these exceptions for these uh, trade agreements. So if a country is trying to create a regular so if the country is trying to uh, create a regulation that goes against the trade agreement, it has to use an exception like privacy. Uh, the GATS, the General Agreement on Trade Services, allows for exceptions for things like uh, public health, national security, and so on. Uh, the exceptions are hard to justify and have many qualifiers. So if you want to pass a legitimate public policy measure, you need to satisfy many requirements. Uh, and basically, so the WTO says that a, re a regulation should be widely practiced measure. And for privacy, you have a big country like the United States that doesn't actually have a federal law. So a country could go to the dispute board and say, look at this country like the United States, they don't even have a privacy law. And there are other countries that also have privacy laws. So now I believe this trend is definitely going towards uh, having privacy measures, but this is just an illustration, an illustrative example of why there needs to be attention on what is happening at the international level, because you can't create local laws if you're not able to comply with these international agreements. Uh, and this is why larger tech companies are starting to have this interest in having a say in, in trade agreements while other stakeholders are being left out. And I'll leave my comments on that for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. Um, I get, I'll give the floor to Miguel right now. And yeah, Miguel, you have five minutes. Thank you. I am in agreement with everything Thomas said. Thank you. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I, I, I am in agreement with most of the things that Thomas said because the, uh, it is uh, basically the, the, the stand of the situation as it is now. Um, I, I was asked to you know, put a, a little bit of an input from an unlocked developing country um, system and situation. And then I have to start by telling you that um, you know, LLDCs, that we face a, a certain situation that is not being able to access um, oceans in, in particular, but in this case, not being able to connect to the backbone of the internet by our, ourselves without touching someone else's sovereignty. And this is an element that wasn't mentioned before, and it's very important, sovereignty in this, in this matter. Me, me being a diplomat has nothing to do with it, don't worry. <laughs> I'm not, not talking about states. But I, I, I did want to uh, put this in perspective. Uh, different countries have these different problems, and the UN level is working very hard in order to try and accommodate everybody, uh, particularly in this scenario where the regulations are still either very basic or growing or trying to catch up with the situation. Uh, digital trade is a fast-growing dynamic that we, we couldn't uh, as governments, it was really hard to understand in order to legislate 20 years ago. So normally, legislation takes time in, in creation and in application. So when you pass a law, the first 
very, very important uh, implications or con consequences of the law take, you know, 10 years to, to actually take over the, the, the national systems. Well, uh, it, that is the case of Paraguay as well. But um, when, when you have to talk about the UN, we have to make certain that people understand that WTO, as, my, as important as it is in the international arena, is not UN. So we're talking in two dif uh, different forms. Uh, and normally countries have different positions on different issues. The same countries have different positions on different issues that relate to each other. And it, it makes the mechanics of the international community a bit more difficult. Then you have to go in, in the understanding that uh, in order to place regulations, you have to go through Congresses. And, and these scenarios, as uh, Thomas noted very well, this you cannot apply national law without taking into account international law. And this is because of the tapestry. The international regulations are there for a reason, and, it comes from, and, it, and they come from different scenarios. They come from the 2030 agenda. They come from the ITU technical regulations that have an effect on trade. They come from WTO that has a different point of view that the, the, the ITU, for example. And, and then you have, uh, for example, a very new agreement that is uh, the EU-Mercosur uh, uh, free trade agreement. Uh, that is being accorded in the diplomatic level. Uh, we still have to go to national congresses in order to s actually say it, is, it has happened. But the first leg of the negotiations are done, and this is, why is this an issue? Because digital trade is very well embedded in this bi-regional um, ac uh, agreement, and it has an effect on regional, sub-regional, and national uh, legislation, because you have to comply with everything else. So uh, we, we, in this scenario, we have, the, for example, the 23rd Agenda at the, at the universal level, the EU in the bi-regional level, the um, OAS, the, American, the, international Farm, uh, sorry, the Organization of American States, uh, that has CTEL, that is the Conference on Telecommunications, that normally, for some reason, bring IG within itself. It's not quite the same, but it, we are still talking about uh, IG within CTEL. Um, and you have Mercosur, that, has, uh, that is a strong player in the region, uh, that is comprised uh, between Paraguay, Argentina, Brazil, and Uruguay. And the same countries that we have to uh, negotiate with in order to access the internet. So you have these uh, different dynamics that all go back and forth and affect the way you need to um, regulate, for example, um, the taxation issues, uh, opening your borders on services and data uh, for a developing country is always uh, a, a little bit dangerous, in the best way possible. I mean, dangerous because uh, you can, uh, you're can you going to encounter a lot of situations you're not normally prepared for, unless you have uh, a strong uh, private sector that already looks into that. But governments-wise, it's, uh, it's normally uh, you have to go to regulate the, the new situations. For example, um, the, the most recent one is Uber for us, because uh, we need to understand what the, con the labor contracts are between Uber and the drivers. And not the particular labor issue, but the taxation issue on the, on the contract, how much taxes are they paying to the uh, national government in order to uh, you know, uh, fulfill the, the, the the needs and the dynamics of the regulations. So uh, this is a new example. Uh, another one for us was uh, the, the, the coming of the uh, multinationals in different sectors that w were normally not uh, regulated as such. Uh, logistics, when they, uh, when they grew in a, th a thousand uh, percent um, uh, in size, uh, forced us to understand uh, international taxation, you know, uh, um, the, the birthplace of the, of the money uh, tells us who needs to be, uh, to be paid the tax. Uh, the companies don't pay 
uh, in every single country. They pay in some countries or just one country, maybe their own where they have their headquarters, not the where they have a branch. And, and that in itself, it's an evolution for a developing country, particularly in regulation, particularly in taxes, and particularly in sovereignty. Because with that comes data, both the commercial data or trade data and personal data. It was well mentioned by Thomas that uh, we, we are going to, to need to agree as much as we can on the free trade, uh, on the free uh, and movement of data, but with, uh, while regulating privacy and uh, data protection for, for, for people and the liability of every single sector. And that, that's one, one important issue with, uh, with data localization. And for example, Paraguay is now uh, recently joined the development center of OECD. And we had the, the evaluation. And uh, we set ourselves a very ambitious set of goals in order for, from here to 2030. And um, we, I'm taking Paraguay as an example, but basically it's going to happen to every single developing country in the world that the framework is going to have to change dramatically in the, la in the next 10 years in order to be able to actually be a part of the global village, you know, to actually be a part of uh, supply chains in the digital arena. Uh, we're going to have to make a quality jump ahead very, very fast, very, very quick. And for that, I, that, that was, that's why calling all actors is very important, because for that, only collaboration and only international cooperation will help us. Um, nobody can do it alone, less so developing countries. I will stop here and give everything, everyone else the chance to talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miguel. Um, we planned a little, like, 10 minutes for Q&A. So if anyone in the audience has any questions, about this first section, um, you are all invited to take the floor. Um, is that the case? We have any initial questions? Um, hi, I'm Guillermo Beltra from Access Now. I guess I'll get us started. Um, we're going to keep talking a little bit. We're going to zoom in more into digital trade in a second in the second section. But I wanted to ask both of you, what do you understand as digital trade? just so that we put kind of the finger on what we're talking about, because um, very different terms are used for different things. And so in your both presentations, you talk a lot about, uh, about a wide range of public policies and economic policies. And in the terminology that we often use in civil society, not everything under what you have talked about is necessarily digital trade. Um, the other reason I think it's important for all of us to agree uh, on a common terminology is because also, for example, in WTO circles, what we understand as digital trade is referred to as e-commerce. Maybe for historical reasons, because e-commerce chapters in international trade agreements have been about digital matters, and now they're calling negotiations on digital matters just e-commerce, while e-commerce is kind of electronic commerce exchanges on the internet and, and buying of goods and so on, but not necessarily um, data protection and privacy considerations, for example. So that's also a very um, confusing terminology that gets used at the WTO and which I think it would be very helpful for just for the, not just for today, and this is a, com a question about in general. Um, so from your perspectives, which you, you follow these matters much more closely, um, I just wanted to ask like, what do you guys call digital trade? Um, Thomas or Miguel, do you, do you want to take, do you want to, yeah, okay, yeah, um, I think you can take this one, sorry. Thank you very much for the question. Um, well, first, uh, when taking digital trade, we have to take the, basically the same idea that trade offline is the same thing that trade online, so whatever you can trade offline, you can trade online as well, as, and so the digital uh, products itself. Um, so trade it would be basically the same uh, concept that has always been. It's whatever you can actually uh, move from one place to another and get something in return. Uh, 
if you put that on a digital level, you will be talking about services and, and data and products that you can move through the uh, a trade operation on the internet or through digital um, means. On the other point that I believe is very, very relevant, uh, the, the definitions, international definitions are first in the UN level very, very hard to get because you have to be uh, as definitive and as loose enough in order to allow definition to uh, evolve by itself. But you have to have something. So UN definitions are normally you know, cornerstones to grow from. Uh, in the case of the WTO, uh, I've been involved with WTO negotiations for a long time. And uh, I think, uh, and talking very, very plainly, I believe uh, digital conversations went to e-commerce just because they don't know where else to put it. It's so big that you have to actually change it to digital WTO, basically. Because they only speak about trade. So they had to put it somewhere else in order to study it. Because WTO, uh, it, being the world center of trade uh, negotiations, still took a lot of time to understand digital trade. They know about what is going on in the world, but they, they were a bit more reluctant than, for example, other uh, sectors like the IGF or ITU that saw trade as a part of something bigger. And, uh, but no, the reason of being of WTO is trade. So they needed to, uh, to study it uh, in a very particular way, so in some particular section of their own work. So thus e-commerce. But still you have uh, WTO working on um, e-health, uh, e-agriculture, and whatever has economical consequences on trade. But basically, it's because of that, and it, it, they're going to need, I believe the ministerial conf uh, conference is going to have to talk about this far more than they used to. And it's very, very new for them. And in a personal level, I can tell you, uh, I wa there, there was a, something called TTT, Technology Transfer and on Trade, that was basically the first group of WTO that took that into account, and it was 2012. So it's basically very new for them too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miguel. I think Thomas wants to just make a comment on this. Um, Thomas, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I think digital trade is, yes, it is just uh, you know digitally enabled transactions of services and goods. But from my own work, I also like to focus on not data is just a means of production or transfer, but the data itself. And I think that's, to me, I see data governance as, the big, as a large part of digital trade when it comes to these cross-border data flows in terms of governing for privacy, data protection, and things like that. So that's really, that's all I had to add to that. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Um, moving on to the second session of section of ah, we have another. Okay, thank you. Well, my name is YZ uh, from Nigeria. Uh, I wanted to follow up on the last discussion and uh, to ask specifically, uh, where do we locate um, trade on the domains, others uh, website domains? and uh, trade in hosting. Uh, I am in a country where um, power and other infrastructure uh, doesn't allow uh, people and organizations to locally host their own websites uh, nationally, and therefore they are hosted mostly in Canada and USA and so forth. And that's for me is a huge flight of uh, uh, capital out of my country. And so I want to know where you locate this in terms of the discussion around uh, digital uh, trade. Thank you. That's, that's a very good question. And uh, I, 
I can give an answer. I can, you know, try and give an answer very, very honestly. Uh, it's because we lack the infrastructure normally, not only on power, talking about electricity itself, and not just political power. And uh, that's why this, this element of uh, sovereignty is so important. Uh, we don't normally have IXPs, national IXPs. We don't normally host our own websites. Uh, so everybody else taking that information has the power to, sh to, to use it without us in the national level, either private sector or public sector, uh, having the possibility of, of saying something about it. So uh, I will say that the first scenario is to dramatically get better on, on critical infrastructure, first, first assuring you know, uh, the, the, the fundamental services, electricity, water, and then going to uh, the backbone of the internet that is critical, uh, that is critical infrastructure, such as our own IXPs and uh, the capacity of uh, storing data in our own countries that normally ha we have to pay for, both for in exp more expensive and less quality internet and for someone holding our data for us. I would, I would say that. Thank you very much, Miguel. Um, any, qu any further questions? Okay. Moving on, um, our second part of this session will be um, a discussion on the impact. So we're, we're calling this Unpacking the Impact, and the idea will be to have a little discussion on those many digital trade topics who are actually having a real impact on the internet today. And for the sake of mentioning them, we're thinking about, on the framing of this session, we were thinking about trade agreements and data privacy adequacy decisions. Also, OECD's proposal for a new global tax system that would see global tax firms tax where they raise revenue um, and not in where they're located. And also some situations in which supply chain security and trade conflicts, and that would be some of the examples I would say I would mention for this part. Um, this, this, um, the, the leads for this section of, of, of our discussion will be Miguel and Guillermo. But also, um, if any of the other panelists wants to jump in and, and offer views on this, on this topic, so they are pretty much invited. So, Guilherme, I guess you have the floor. Um, thank you. Uh, I guess, um, so for those, well, first of all, thank you for inviting us. I didn't, um, now that I kind of speak more formally, can introduce us. Access Now um, is a global digital rights NGO um, where we defend the kind of sort of human rights uh, in technology uh, for users at risk. And we focus particularly that that risk. We underscore that um, because that's that's the 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 main mission that we and and the focus that we always try to take on on any work we do. Um, unfortunately, we only follow what I, my understanding of digital trade issues uh, from a very superficial perspective because of reasons that we're going to uh, actually unpack later on today as we move into the multi-stakeholderism discussion as well and, and how digital trade negotiations work. But just coming back to the question, and here's the reason why I asked it before, um, the question why I asked what is digital trade is because, like Thomas just said, we are talking about data governance and what happens to personal data around the world in the context of how do we set international rules for products and services that move around the world electronically? And from our perspective, and it is fortunately the perspective of a large part of the digital rights ecosystem around the world, that is just the wrong framing. And the reason for that is because we cannot treat, like you, all of you will have heard, data is the new oil. I've been in Geneva and I have heard, oh, it's not oil, data is like avocados, uh, because they're only what was the metaphor? Um, they're highly valuable, but only for a certain period of time. And if you don't use it quickly, then kind of the value diminishes. Or, or I've seen like data, it's like bananas. No, it's none of that. Personal data is personal inherently, and it's linked to a human right. And that's, that's for us the, the main starting point in this conversation, is that we are asking ourselves, how can we set rules on trading human rights? And the answer is, well, you shouldn't. 
And the reason why then I ask what is what do we consider digital trade is because if, for example, we talk about adequacy decisions or we talk about um, data protection and privacy frameworks that include provisions on how data can flow from different jurisdictions, that is not digital trade. That is not an international trade agreement. That is a legal framework that is designed to regulate a human right, which includes provisions on how it can operate internationally. And those are two very different things. And here's why. I'll take the paradigmatic example of the general uh, data protection regulation in the European Union, of course, which many, uh, a lot of the industry has portrayed as very protectionist or, and, and I have heard some countries around the world also say like, how can we comply with it and so on. We need to remember that the GDPR, the full title of the GDPR is the general data protection regulation and on the free flow of data. So it contains a lot of provision precisely to enable that exchange of data and to enable um, e-commerce and just international transactions. The Council of Europe Convention 108, which is signed by a couple dozen uh, countries around the world, is also a legal instrument designed to protect a human right in a way in which also enables the internet to exist while protecting that human right. For a few years now, we've seen like a few examples, Thomas has, shown, uh, has talked about a few examples and now uh, Miguel has talked about the WTO as well, increasingly trade agreements, either bilateral, multilateral, or now plurilateral at the WTO, incorporate chapters and conversations about issues linked to data protection and privacy and data flows. And so my question, I put the question back to you guys is, what is the problem that we're trying to solve? What is the problem, like, is the internet not working because we don't have a plurilateral trade agreement at the WTO that contains data flows provisions? Because I still, I, I still haven't seen anybody articulate a legal or economic problem that in order to solve, we need that kind of policy instrument to solve it. So for us, the solution is not, let's go into trade circles and have data flows provisions because first, the high level objective of trade negotiations will be to liberalize trade, not to protect human rights. So that's just the first step that is the wrong framing. Second, like Thomas has said, they're very non-transparent conversations. There's no multi-stakeholderism. Um, the communities that will be affected by those negotiations will not be heard. And third, the negotiations are done by trade experts who are there basically with the mandate to reduce trade barriers and increase their trade uh, quotas and so on, not by human rights experts. So for us, the high level comment there is that to talk about all these discussions, we're taking them to the wrong fora. And if we don't correct that, we're going to have, be taking very serious decisions about how the internet operates and how human rights are respected or not um, in the wrong place. I'm going to stop there because I know I'm raising a lot of questions and we can continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah you certainly took on a lot of very important issues. I, I wanted to, to take the conversation up in a bit of, a, let's see, an upbeat uh, way, because the, the impacts are not, uh, not all uh, just legal or taxative or uh, economical. They, they bring, they bring uh, to life as well uh, new opportunities for the development of people and and um, the, the realization of the, the SDGs. And uh, for example, just um, to give you an example, I, in one generation, my generation would, uh, I'm 40. <laughs> I'm, I'm a bit <laughs> old already. But uh, uh, my generation wouldn't have all the chances that the next generation of 20 year olds now have just to study, uh, to go into different sectors. We wouldn't have that. We wouldn't have normal, you know, very traditional uh, careers. But now, 
we have 52 new universities and a vast range of things you can do by uh, getting a, a degree in different digital areas. So um, these opportunities and, 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 for example, hackathons and, uh, and job opportunities in a service sector or agro-technologies that are very, very strongly growing in different parts of the world. In a, a, a simple example that I can give is that now we are a 7 million people country who feeds 80 million people country around the world, or 80 million people around the world. And, and that's because of the use of technologies. Otherwise, you wouldn't have developed the genetics and the, the logistics in order to do so. Um, this evolves with the social responsibility of the private sector, of companies. And they need to help to um, realize the human rights uh, enabled tools already existing. That's very important what you said, because we don't, I don't believe, I'm very hesitant on saying we need a convention for trade in order to uh, secure the realization of rights within the, the trade system. I would say uh, the human rights conventions are already there. We need to make enterprises understand them correctly and apply them correctly in order to, uh, to ensure that we are not taking personal data outside its boundaries. And that, I, I, at the same time, I'm already answering <laughs> of what I think a bit. But uh, I would end by saying that the social responsibility of the private and public sector need, need to be aligned in order for all policy, policies, both trade and human rights, to benefit the whole of the populations, the peoples of the world. And, and we have to think that way. Otherwise, uh, the, the government is going to go one way and the, the private sector another way, and we will normally have conflict of interests when we need to be aligned in policies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, once again, we have the opportunity for anyone who wants to ask questions and take the floor. So if there's anyone interested. Um, hello, my name is Johanna. I'm, I'm from the FU Berlin. And I um, wanted to go back to your question whether um, data flows and privacy issues should be regulated or discussed within um, trade forums. I think on one side it probably has to because the data flows are pretty much underlying digital trade. On the other side, I do see your point that it's a human right and might not be the right um, issue for being negotiated. Um, so I really see a dilemma there as well. Um, I think at the end, I mean, the, um, the European Union did decide to not negotiate privacy issues in their free trade agreements. And that's actually a question I would like to raise to um, Thomas, whether you see this strategy will work in the future. And plus, in another way that the European Union chose is the adequacy decision. And my question would be there if that might be, or it might turn out as a um, protectionist tool for um, countries that are not able to um, rise to the regulation that's um, required by the European Union. And if at the end, less developed or economically less developed countries might actually be disadvantaged by those um, instruments instead of tra free trade agreements. So actually, yeah, those are my questions. Okay. I'll give the floor to Thomas then. I, I, he wants to comment on this as well. Hello. Uh, so I completely agree with the fact that this like this disconnect between trade discussions and more of like the values, human rights of privacy or, you know, freedom of speech or like other democratic ideals, there can be this disconnect between the two. So I really I taking Europe as an example, you kind of have a uh, you can see that, like we talked about, the EU Commission has stated that they'll only sign free trade agreements that uh, kind of contain language on the f regarding the free flow of data if they're also deemed adequate in terms of like the, you know, an adequacy decision with their current data protection. So in order for a government like Japan to enter into agreement with the European Union, they also need to be t deemed adequate and their data protection laws and enforcement of those laws need to be equivalent to the EU. So to me, to answer that question, I, I do prefer that view because I, like we were talking about trade 
discussions frame the debate around trade just and then you're getting at efficiencies and maximizing data flows while losing thoughts about other core values that you might have or human rights. So to me, I see the societal impacts of digital trade as very important. And because in these agreements, there are values at play like privacy uh, that need to be protected. And when we only look at digital trade from a trade perspective, like we do when talking about trade agreements, we can lose sight of these important values. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks. So um, thank you for the question. And Thomas, also for your uh, remarks. Oh, there's a bit of an echo. Oh, that's okay. sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so first of all, let me clarify that we're not against data flows. It's not like I understand for the internet to work, uh, data has to move and personal data has to move. And these are all kind of trans jurisdiction on null services. And of course, the question, like coming back to my initial challenge is like, what is the problem that we're trying to solve by getting data flows provisions into international trade agreements? And I still, and I'm not, I don't need an answer today, but I've, I've asked this question repeatedly and the answers are normally very hypothetical or, and or related to data localization requirements in countries around the world, which we all know big countries that want to kind of splinter the internet. And, and, and that's a very valid conversation. Um, the problem is like the problem where we're coming from, and I think Thomas was hinting at, at that as well, is that an international trade agreement will be binding on the country that signs it and has to adapt their own rules. And so our fear is, and we've seen this um, uh, in different negotiations that the EU has, exchange, has initiated, that if a country or uh, a region like the EU binds itself to something that it has a, a lower level of protection than what it gives itself, like for example with the GDPR, it will have to change that protection as well. And instead of um, having that race to the bottom, what we want, like Thomas was also hinting at, is a race to the top. And so, if it, and I think the evidence we see is that the, the GDPR has helped push the data protection conversation around the world. More and more countries are creating legal frameworks that are intended to protect uh, people's personal data. And by the way, a reminder also that the adequacy decisions are not the only instrument that countries around the world have to enable data flows with the EU. There's other legal basis in the, in the GDPR that can be used as well. Thank you very much, Guillermo. Um, any other questions on this? Okay. If you want. working on IT issues since then, and I'm one of, I must admit I'm one of the few people in the WTO who goes to ITU and IGF and, and everything else. I just wanted to say that what I've heard from private sector is a little different than what you're saying. What I've heard from private sector and some of the documents they submit that are, are publicly available is they are being blocked in the various uh, markets. Uh, some of it is blocking that you wouldn't like for human rights reasons as well as us. The WTO can't do a lot about it, that. So you really do need human rights rules for things like censorship and, uh, and uh, blocking things because of freedom of speech. But there are also, for example, apparently in the Chinese market, there's between eight and 12 different services that I work on services agreement that are covered with obligations that they should be able to trade, but they can't trade uh, because they're completely blocked as a service, not just filtering or takedown requests. So that's the kind of thing we're hearing, that the kind of trade that should be happening globally isn't always happening because there's blocking going on. And they feel they need a principle that establishes that as a first order, you don't interfere with data flows. But then they all recognize that you need something that allows these what some people call non-trade policies to be in effect. And since 1995, privacy has been recognized as one of the non-trade policies covered by the exceptions that already exist. So this debate to me about the exceptions that should be the second paragraph of a data flows provision is a little weird because some of them are actually um, GATS minus 
which is interesting because I don't know how you can have two agreements with one, within one organization that one basically has one set of obligations with respect to exceptions and the other doesn't. Um, the other thing is that I think privacy would not be erased to the bottom because the way our exception works, we don't, we don't question the standards. So you can have higher standards, you can unfortunately have lower standards, but what would be questioned is the way you got there. And if the way you got there was basically what, uh, more burdensome than necessary to achieve your objective, not anybody else's objective, but your objective, that's what the disciplines try to get at. So the panels never question that your, your, your quality standard or, or your privacy standard is higher than the next uh, government's quality or privacy standard. Um, I just thought that that is something that puzzles me a little bit in the discussion. I've been working in the Internet and Jurisdiction program with a lot of people who are really concerned about the human rights stuff. My first job I ever had was human rights. I haven't done it since, so I'm learning more about these treaties that are put into effect. And, and what impresses me is both the WTO and the Human Rights Convention are fundamentally seeking good governance for slightly different reasons, but I think there's a commonality of the ultimate objective is that governments behave themselves, either vis-a-vis -vis businesses or citizens, and I, I don't think they're incompatible. Just to be controversial. <laughs> thank you very much for your participation. Um, I don't think I got your name, but... Lee Tuckhill. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so moving on, do we have so any further questions on this, or can we move on to the multi-stakeholder participation in those forums? Because the, for this, past, um, this last um, section, the proposal is to actually build up on what the IGF makes us believe, which is the multi-stakeholder participation and having all stakeholders and, and interested parties raising their voices in this conversation. But still, um, the fact that um, those forums, they still exist, and, and some of them, they might be ignoring this, this need for participation and this need for actually listening to more than just national states and, and delegate, at the delegation level. So um, for this last section, the idea, the name of it is multi-stakeholder collaboration, the only way forward. And we will have Kathleen and Guillermo for this discussion. If you want to join as well, you're also invited. But um, I'll give the floor to Kathleen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bruna. Um, so it's very interesting to try to bridge that because I actually have absolutely zero experience in trade and I've been listening to this and I'm like, yep, and that's part of the reason why multi-stakeholderism doesn't work because there's so many buzzwords in this conversation already and everyone mentions trade, but everyone comes from a different angle. And part of that is that stakeholders have a tendency to frame things out of their bubble and we all have an intrinsic objective and a motivation of what we're trying to achieve. But we use the same words for different reasons and for different purposes. And it seems like there's, there's often an, a lack of translation um, between those stakeholders. And I'm saying that as somebody who's worked across stakeholders. So I started academia, worked in government, worked in private sector, and now work in civil society. And I've, I've seen it from every angle and I've learned how to strategize for each of those stakeholder groups. But having done that, I also do see a desperate need to translate better in why we are where we are. And there is lessons to be learned from everyone. And I think the, the main thing everyone needs to remember, it's not just we are right and multi-stakeholder is something all of us do, but it takes a lot of time. And multi-stakeholder is not a one-off. It is a process and it needs transparency, inclusion, and accountability every single time, not once. And that's often forget forgotten. So governments, and I know that, again, from experience, um, often forget to explain how the process works and make the rules of procedure clear, which makes it really hard for other stakeholders to actually play. So a lot of things you said, I'm like, you probably have all the processes in place. It's really hard to learn about them. And it's, but it's, it's also really hard to then find the entry point. When can I actually raise something that might not be on your radar right now? Because the world is growing. It's a very complex place to be at. So how can we actually get to the complexity in an appropriate way? It's super hard. And civil society has a tendency to say, like, you're, not, you're ignoring human rights, and you're just moving to a next forum where we can't get in because it's a government place, and we, we keep pushing into new venues. It's like 
like it's been a process for 20 years. We've opened up the Human Rights Council. Now we've opened up the IGF. We've opened up the G20. Now we need to go to WTO, and our resources are limited, and civil, civic space is shrinking, and it's getting harder and harder and harder to be at all of those venues, which means we start criticizing in bulk. So rather than going to a process where we can actually make a difference, we just use the tools we've always used in the hope that they will work. So it's kind of throwing something at it in the hope that that starts a conversation. And I think there is this, and I feel like trade might be that next iteration of how do we actually do multi-stakeholder in all of us, and that really goes for every single one, including private sector, government, academia. What is the process, and what's the phase we're in in that process? Because it's not like, you discuss something and then there's a law. You discuss something and then there's an agreement. But the question is, is something already on the agenda? What should we tackle? What's the issue? That is one phase that takes a certain set of actors. It takes a certain set of engagement. It allows for certain activities and it has a specific output that's the agenda. And then the question is, What's the deliberation, which usually means, yet again, who's affected? Who should be at the table? Have we actually considered everyone? Who is allowed to raise their voice? It's not as straightforward as it often seems before we even go to drafting, which is an entirely different stage, which might be more secluded because whoever takes the pen has the power, right? So there is some, some responsibility in that. And then the question is, how do we actually make it happen? Implementation, which is yet again an entirely different process with different actors before we go back to ask, what have we learned from this process and what needs to change going forward? Which is what many stakeholders are not really willing to go because once you've reached the agreement, it's like, man, can we just be done? No, we can't because that's not how the world works. And I think the main reason that I got invited for this input is I remember when the G20 Digital issues kept popping up in the G20 discussions for years. There was never a track. There's still not really a track. And when I joined Mozilla, I'm, as I said, like we're not for profit organization, so we consider ourselves civil society. It was impossible for us to join the C20 track because our legal structure isn't really an NGO, but we're also not a private sector. We're a merger of both. So we couldn't join any of those tracks and be a party. I'm like, so if you're not allowing me to play, then the rules are wrong because we do have a stake in this and it is important for us. Um, so the way we went about this, I was like, okay, I can't even raise an issue. I don't even get to this point where there's a clear procedure and a process for me to say digital issues need to be treated in a comprehensive, progressive manner. So the way we went about it is that we build a coalition of stakeholders who also were facing the challenge of not actually even getting in the room to say, we need to talk about this. There was nowhere to land this. So we built a coalition of about 120 organizations worldwide from all continents to raise that in a public campaign. So we sort of didn't play by the rules, but we still got hurt. And the way it's changed is that governments since have always reached out to those of us that initiated that coalition to say, who needs to be invited again? And I think that shows as an it can happen, but you need to be very targeted in what you're asking for. So we weren't able to implement, to influence the text itself, but at least we got to say there needs to be a process in place where people can raise issues. And that's what we were hoping for, just as an example, and happy to go into detail if that's helpful. Thank you very much, Kathleen. Um, Guilherme, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Um, hmm, so many things to say. So I think the, f the first thing is that just to quote what Kathleen was saying, we're not trying to criticize this in bulk in the sense of just digital trade is wrong or data flows are wrong. My point is, and I, I'll just reinstate that, is that questions that touch upon human rights, we need to come up with other political legal constructs, um, like for example, the interaction between different data protection regulators that already exist and they can come up with international binding norms. Um, there's a privacy shield, for example, between the US and the EU, which um, we don't like for a number of reasons, but kind of those initiatives, those different forays where conversations about where personal data flows should happen. Um, and I'm just using the moment to respond also to some of your comments. I hear you about China and Russia want a different internet split uh, uh, from the world. And I know you didn't say that. I, I know, I know, but I'll just, you know. Yeah, I work for an NGO, so I can take that license. Um, now, I would wonder whether a multilateral trade agreement is really going to solve that issue, but, you know, 
I, I get that there are some issues there, but we, but we shouldn't, in doing that, create an ecosystem that then can have an impact on human rights. And that's why we try to kind of at a higher level separate the two things. Now, my point is now to, to Kathleen's point, I think, which we, I, I agree, the solution on, for digital trade to be better on digital rights and, and human rights and so on is not multi-stakeholderism. Like I agree with just, we can't just keep chasing fora after fora and saying, okay, you gotta open it up. Now we'll fight for years so that documents start being open and so on. We have, there is in the, in the digital rights space, a very, very important lack of resources. And it's a fairly new space. And for us, it's a luxury to work on these long-term issues when, for example, for us, which we do a lot of work on internet shutdowns, the internet is being shut down across the world like every day. And so we have to focus on the most immediate problems. And it's, it's really hard for us to come to these more long-term and technical conversations. Coming to Geneva is extremely expensive, as I'm sure you know. Um, Living there is, too. Yeah, I, I'm sure, <laughs> yes. Um, so I know there are, there are small things, like for example, we're here at IGF, we've got online participation, live transcription, a live stream, a more open process. It doesn't mean that it works for everything, but it is a fairly decent model for multi-stakeholderism um, that could be used elsewhere. But I think our kind of more thinking for all these fora where we're never gonna get that meaningful engagement from all the communities that are affected by those policy decisions that are being made, is maybe instead of trying to bring civil society into those fora is bring those fora into, this, into the ones where civil society already is. Come to the IGF, bring WTO negotiations, not the negotiations, bring WTO linked conversations to IGF, bring them to RightsCon. For those of you who don't know, RightsCon is an, an annual conference we organize, um, biggest digital rights uh, conference around the world, and the community is there. Well done, thank you, just that. <laughs> um, I have more here for a new one who might need one. Um, yeah, so we got those fora and we do put a lot of efforts to make sure that the whole community is there. So let's use that more smartly uh, the best way we can. Um, my question to both you, Kathleen and Yem, will be that I guess both Mozilla and Nexus now have been championing the participation in such spaces, both at the multi-stakeholder and multilateral level. Sometimes if you go on to the Human Rights Council or any other arenas, um, they have, that have these different sorts of participation. So would you have any advice for like smaller organizations or civil society who is meaning to be more present or to have a more active voice on this? Or maybe how do you see this, this path moving forward? How do we see like what are the possible paths for collaboration in this? I think one answer is don't try to do it all. Um, because there are limited resources and you'll be more powerful if you really know where you can make a difference. And most organizations have a unique purpose for why they exist. And if you champion those things of why your organization exists, that's where you make the biggest impact. Because it's really easy, and Mozilla has the same issue. I mean, Mozilla, yes, is a very recognized, comparatively big civil society organization, but compared to who we compete with, we're tiny. Right? So we also have to prioritize, and we have a tendency to do everything, and then you don't do anything well. So there's always this, where can you really make a difference? And that's what I mean with the faces, because especially for small organizations, getting something on the agenda can be incredibly time-consuming. It might be that in deliberation processes, focusing on bringing the facts and actually raising examples and awareness on things people might not be aware of, might be where you get the most value. It still means you won't be in this place actually writing things down, which does hold power, but focus on that. Or if you're an organization focused on litigation, think about how to structure evaluation processes that allow you to initiate a new process and make it better. So you might not stop something, but you might be able to iterate and improve. And I think that's, that's a different answer for every organization, but in this, also at IGF, everything is happening at once and really choosing your battles <laughs> and trying to figure out where you, with your passion and the things you bring, the insights you bring, have the biggest impact is hard because you always feel like you could even do more. But we're all burning out if we do everything at once. Uh, thank you, yeah, I cannot agree more. I think that's a constant challenge we all face, whether big or small NGOs, but um, 
we have the privilege of being able to work on quite a significant number of issues and still I can guarantee it's a constant challenge for us to be prioritizing where we should be because like Kathleen says, everything is just happening at the same time. I think um, policymakers here and governments have a very, very important role and that's my key call because especially towards those smaller NGOs that might represent um, I don't know, more vulnerable communities and perspectives for these debates that really have to be heard, um, they bear policymakers, I think, the biggest responsibility in enabling processes and even funding streams to enable those those organizations to participate. And it can the, the the responsibility can't always be put on civil society and okay, you guys organize yourselves, go find your resources and come tell us what you think. No. That's that's the, the I think the basic message is you need to make it much easier for that to happen. Um, yeah, I'll stop it there. Can I just jump in immediately on that? Because the organizing part and the collaborating part, building that coalition for G20 was only possible because it had Mozilla behind it. It takes a lot of resources. Coordination takes forever, and it's completely underestimated of how time-consuming and how emotionally challenging it is to have 120 organizations all needing something. It just, it really, most organizations are not in the position to collaborate with other organizations because they're so heads down in fixing their issues. So it's like also acknowledging smaller organizations for it's okay for you to focus on that, but don't expect civil society to be an organized block. It's almost impossible. Um, questions, comments, ideas? I know you had your hand raised. Do you want to? Just on exactly this topic, I am the first to admit uh, because unlike some of my colleagues, I go to a lot of the other international organizations and regional organizations, we are the most archaic in terms of actual participation in meetings. I have the privilege of being able to sit in as an observer in organizations that we don't allow them to sit in as an observer, much less anybody else. And in that sense, the, the, starting with LAMI, DGs have tried to create informal mechanisms for, he, they've recently had what he calls trade policy dialogues. Uh, had one with business, but another one exclusively with the consumer protection organizations and NGOs. Um, maybe he should move on to some other forms of NGOs. That said, I think the fact that you have now, all of these FTAs that had e-commerce have now coalesced and come to the WTO. So you have one focal point now. And in that sense, I think the WTO is a lot less secretive than the bilateral or FTA negotiations may have been, because even if something is supposed to be confidential, frankly, anybody will give it to you. <laughs> you can't admit if I did, but a lot of delegations want people to know about things. We also, um, just so you know, we have a proposal by the New Zealanders because of this idea that um, trade negotiations were criticized as being uh, um, too secretive to make public these draft texts uh, as soon as possible. Um, the fact is the draft text is nothing but a compendium of, you've all seen them, different governments pieces of their FTAs. So there's nothing in there you haven't seen somewhere, but um, right now it's a mess because you have you know, seven different versions of the FTA uh, drafting of a particular provision with everybody saying, oh, well, <laughs> are we all saying the same thing or not saying the same thing? And, and that's what they're asking themselves. They don't really know yet. Um, when that comes out, which I would estimate they'd be ready for something to come out if they can agree, and I think they will, uh, because they've been more transparent than most of our processes even up to this point, would probably be in the early spring, at the latest in the next ministerial. It might be something since they won't have achieved any results by June they may feel as though that may try to show the world we're trying to do something and make it public at that point. So there will be things to comment on. Now, in terms of participation, even if you can't afford to come to Geneva, even the private sector has trouble doing that. They formed a coalition of coalitions of private associations to, to shave their resources. You can send us press releases. You know, we can make them available to delegations. I have this guerrilla tactic of, um, putting all kinds of links on the e-commerce webpage. And since nobody bets what I do on that webpage, <laughs> that I, I'm putting all these links to interesting. 
Oh, right, you know, that will say, what did Lee do? You know, <laughs> you know, I put all kinds of resources down in the left-hand side of the sort of standard e-commerce that WTO had this meeting and that meeting. So I, I tend to like to post information so people can be aware. Thank you very much. Um, questions or comments? The floor is open again. No? Good. <laughs> Um, if not, I will ask our panelists to maybe, if you want to do a wrap-up comment on this, on how, or if not, we can just also finish the session, but um, you're all invited to offer a last comment on this, and I pretty much appreciate this opportunity, and thank you all for being here. So I guess I'll give the floor first to Thomas, and then to Guilherme or Kathleen, if you want to. Yeah, so... Uh to basically wrap up, I would say that I'm worried about like a lack of transparency in trade negotiations and just that uh, when we're talking about digital trade, like we were talking earlier, it kind of frames the debate towards trade and the people who have the most say in this and the ones who kind of the, their values are at stake when it comes to digital trade are companies basically who are looking for possibly a free flow of information while not protecting other rights possibly like privacy so my worry is kind of how can civil society get involved into this for uh, when digital trade might not even be the right framing to protect what's at value for most civil society stakeholders and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Um, Kathleen, are you there? Sure. sure. There's a, the echo is really weird. Um, thank you for you actually being here. Like, I think one of the other things, apart from civil society choosing their battles, also as a former government official, there are people like you who actually try to increase transparency and who are around in pretty much every single process in every international organization and every government around the world. So sometimes it's also about recognizing that these are not black boxes, they're not a block, but there are individuals in there who really try to serve the public interest, who are in this for serving and the heart and finding the right allies and understanding, letting them help you understand the process is also sometimes an important tool we tend to forget because if you're angry at something, it can be hard to find the person who actually wants a very similar thing from you. So find the people who support you within the organization you're trying to change, I think is another thing to leave it on. Thank you. I, actually, I, I would plus one what Kathleen just said. It's great that somebody like you would come and have this and engage in this conversation. I think we need way more of that. And so I would encourage you to do, keep doing that and bring more colleagues along and we'll organize. <laughs> you should come to RightsCon. Um, I guess, like, not to repeat anything we've said, but for me, like, if I look, look at the conversation we've had today, it's a complex conversation about the architecture of our, uh, you know, legal and economic constructs and how we deal with these things. Where we come from is, at the end of the day, this is about individual human beings. Like, we're going to, all these things are going to impact their lives it's not, it's not even anymore about the internet, which it is. It's what, like, what do we do with this immense uh, public good that we all love? Uh, but it's about the individuals that live in it and how their human rights, their right to, f to express freely, to participate freely, to, 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 to assembly, um, will be able to be exercised in the future. So my call would be to any policymakers in the room or watching online is don't take these things lightly. The way in which we negotiate and set the rules for the future about all of this is going to define how open and human rights respecting our societies are. Uh, so it's very, very important. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Guillermo. Um, and thank you all for being here, I guess. That the, the, main, the main message we get from this is that Actually ignoring those issues and ignoring those forums won't make them go away. And also the other way around, isn't it, isn't the same, is, is the same, pretty much the same because um, there's a whole impact on the actual human rights impact that this all, and also on the internet that all of these trade agreements and discussions they end up causing, they're also very real. So I do appreciate as well your presence here, Lee. 
and as our volunteer panelists. I'm super happy about it. <laughs> and yeah, I'm just wrapping up the session and thank you all for being here. Um, that, 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 thank you. <laughs>